Tyson Kalberg is with us from Asana. He's going to talk to us about the fifth dimension of prototyping. Five the five dimensions. dimensions. Yeah, all right. Like okay, give it up for Tyson, everybody. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, so yeah, like he said, uh, I'm product designer at Asana. Um, I came here fairly recently, in the last three months, from Vancouver, BC. Uh, where I spent about six years working at a mobile development agency running a team of designers. Uh, so I've sort of made the leap to this wonderful and weird world of product. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, basically prototyping and design and sort of what prototyping has become in design, um, as well as this whole idea of these five dimensions. Uh, and then I'm going to walk through some like, actual, actual examples. Oh, I think I went back instead of forward. <laughs> it's the fifth dimension. It is. There are no slides, that's the dimension. There we go. Um, so prototypes are like unicorns. Uh, and I know Cap just said that there are unicorns everywhere. Um, <laughs> I wish that was true. I feel like it's not. Um, and I feel like prototypes for us have become a lot like the idea of the unicorn um, because there's sort of this idea of the prototype, this sort of perfect thing that will solve, our problem, solve all of our problems and answer all of our questions. Um, but I believe like attaining that is actually really difficult. Um, so the question is, what do the rest of us do? Um, and to me, this kind of comes down to prototypes that are very specific. So you'll see in the sort of examples I give today and sort of the uh, idea of these dimensions is the idea that uh, the best prototypes are the ones that solve a question we couldn't answer with Photoshop, and they solve it in a time that isn't ridiculous. I think we all have this tendency to sort of get into the weeds and we want to make this prototype like every button's interactive and we got all the hit states and everything feels really good. Um, and to some extent, that's awesome, but it also takes a really long time. And unless you're some kind of super unicorn, I mean, I don't know how many designers here can do something as quickly in code as they can in Photoshop, uh, but it's not me. Like, I can't do that. Um, so basically, it's about finding um, something you need to solve and making something very specific to fix it. Um, so that's sort of where these five dimensions of prototyping come in. Um, and I didn't invent these. These are uh, off of a paper from someone whose name I probably should have written down and given credit to, uh, but they're awesome. <laughs> uh, and basically, this is kind of a mental framework. It's the idea there's, it's to sort of it's to reap off the idea that there's just low fidelity and high fidelity. There's actually multiple different dimensions of fidelity in a prototype. Um, so the first one is visual. Uh, so this is just really simple. It's visual fidelity. Is this a sketch? Is it a fully, uh, fully rendered uh, pixel perfect mock? Uh, interactions, so this is like if it's a click through prototype and I just hit the screen and it just advances, it's very little interactivity. Or are there like a bunch of different buttons I can push? Um, breadth, that's just use cases. So like, is my entire navigation navigable? Is there a setting screen? Is there a profile? Like, how big is this prototype? Um, depth, um, that's covering sort of all these little use, uh, edge cases. Is there verification errors? Uh, this kind of thing. Are there blank screens to show that example? Uh, and then the fifth one, which I think to me, and you'll see in these examples, is kind of the most interesting one. Um, it's the idea of data. Uh, I think designers have this bad habit of sort of creating the perfect mock, uh, the one with the right size title, the right, you know, very pretty paragraph. Uh, and engineers always come back and they're like, yeah, that title looks great, but it looks like it looks fucking terrible when it's truncated. And you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about that. Um, and I think it's sort of, I'm, I come from a very like, I come from web and print. Um, and I feel like the idea of data and software is a lot more important. Um, and it's been a while now, so I kind of realize that. But uh, I think data is something really interesting to focus on. Um, so obviously the full product is all five of these in all directions. Uh, that takes the most time. Um, so I'm going to walk through a couple of sort of like, prototypical prototype examples. Um, so there's paper prototypes. Uh, you get a lot of breadth, um, but they're often very visually, there's very little visual fidelity. Um, but they're pretty easy to set up. Um, you can kind of get a fair amount of interaction there. Uh, the next one is motion prototypes. So these are things you might do in After Effects and Quartz Composer. Um, I'm thinking that more like testing animations. What do transitions look like? How does this button move when you tap it? Uh, high visual fidelity, but sort of very little uh, any kind of interaction or, or data. Uh, and then everyone's favorite prototype, click-through prototypes. These are things we build in Envision, Fireworks, Keynote. Um, basically, we can have a lot of depth, uh, visual fidelity, but it takes, it takes time. It takes a lot of time to make something that's sort of fully featured. Um, so examples. So I'm going to go through three. Um, the first one is not mine, but it's from Asana. Uh, it is a font prototype. It's super. So all of these are really, really narrow. They're sort of really focusing on one of the dimensions. Um, so Asana had to change their font. Uh, on, their web, on their web app, and basically it was like we wanted to see what the fonts looked like on the page in different browsers at different sizes. Um, so there's this page built up, and effectively it's just an image, and there's a lot of sort of HTML, live HTML elements over it, and then you can see at the bottom there's a bunch of different font names. Um, so basically what it allowed us to do is like 
add fonts to this file and then quickly click through them um, and see how they looked uh, actually on the page. And why that was awesome is again, because like browsers render things differently, OSs render things differently, and getting a sense of like what the readability of all these fonts would be on those different, uh, in those different situations. Uh, so at the end of this, it was a very easy to pick a font and then just sort of like move on and have that done. It was a lot quicker than sort of going in and changing every little text field in Photoshop. Oh, there was one more example. Oops. Um, so the next one is the data visualization example. Um, this one's kind of nuts and kind of nerdy. <laughs> Um, I don't know, I'm from Canada, so I, this is a hockey example. I feel like I had to have one of those. Um, does anybody in this room know how hockey works? You can raise your hands. That's actually not too bad. Um, so for those of you who don't, hockey is a team sport. It's played on ice. There are skates, there are sticks, there are pucks. Um, and effectively, there's a rink. Um, and that's sort of a very, very complicated version of the rink. You can kind of see there's this rink, there's two halves, um, there's zones. Anyways, I won't go too much into the details, but basically, um, we had a sports project, uh, it was a mobile project, and the idea was is we wanted to revise everything and really integrate a lot more infographics to sort of give a better story of the game. Um, and there's this thing about infographics, they've become fairly trendy in the past year, year and a half, um, but the problem with them is a lot of them are just tabular data displayed in a pretty way, um, and it doesn't really give any more context. In reality, if we just give the people the numbers, they actually provide a lot more value. Um, so one of the challenges for us was to figure out with the data from the game that we had, what could we do with it? So, breathe, there we go. Um, basically, we got data with, uh, from the actual feeds of real game data, and using Quartz Composer brought that in and started basically sketching live data. Um, so this is one of those examples. This is a fairly common thing on sports websites. Uh, basically what you're seeing here is there's a rank, um, and you're seeing sort of groupings of plays. So the plays that we got were we got hits, we got penalties, we got goals, we got assists, uh, we got face-offs, so you'll see like there's these little groupings uh, in the corners in the middle, those are face-offs, you can see hits sort of tend to be around the boards, there's boards in hockey, there's a lot of physical contact, it's very violent. Um, and basically we, we projected this onto a rank and it kind of looked like we expected, right? Like things are happening where they are and at the end of the day it's really, really, really noisy. Um, and one of the things we wanted to try to avoid uh, was noise. So we went through a bunch of different iterations and I'm only gonna show you guys sort of one midpoint. Um, but basically we wanted to try to find the narrative of this game um, and sort of what we isolated it to be was this idea of momentum. Um, and basically like could we see, so games have a feel, right? Like there's ebbs and flows, the home team has advantages and they seem to be getting kind of clobbered and we really wanted to try to capture that. Um, so here's another example, um, kind of the same problem, right? We got a lot of plays, it's really noisy, it's not really telling you anything. Like you can see uh, there's three periods in hockey. I'm gonna keep trying to remember random hockey stats to keep you guys, so you can get what I'm saying. Um, so there's two bars in the middle, um, and you can see it's divided into periods. Um, but again, there's no, there's no sense of flow. It's just a bunch of stuff happening all the time. Um, so what we came to is this. Um, so on thinking about sort of all this noise and stuff, we realized that we were looking at too many of the plays, and we really need to isolate a little bit more. Um, and we thought about like what plays really defined uh, the momentum of the game. Um, and what we decided that was, was basically shots and goals. If a team was shooting a puck at a net and the goalie was blocking it, that shows that they're putting pressure on the other team. Um, so what you see here is, is a graph representing that. So the x-axis is time. Uh, you can see vertical lines representing period breaks. Uh, and the dots you see are goals. Now, what the graph is doing is, and this is sort of the weird complicated part, uh, when the home team shoots, it goes up a point, And when the away team shoot, it goes down a point. Um, so what you get is, is if the, it was perfectly equal and they exchanged shot for shot, graph wouldn't move. Um, but what we started to see is, is that the shape of the graph was representative of the shots, and what we end up seeing is there's a lot of different shapes. So you can see this game, like the first period, the away team had an advantage, and then the, the home team sort of brought it back. There it is. Uh, this one's like super back and forth. Uh, this one's very lopsided, like the home team was shooting a lot more than the away team. So the difference you see, that sort of gap between the midpoint and the graph is sort of the advantage for uh, that team. Um, so what we found is we got a lot of different shapes out of this. Um, and the shapes actually pretty well represented exactly how the game was going. Um, there was this famous game last year in the playoffs where the Toronto Maple Leafs threw it all away at the end. Um, so if there's any Toronto fans in the crowd, I doubt it. <laughs> um, but basically there was this, there was graph and it saw them coming up and then there was this spike back down again. Um, and we printed it out and started showing it to some of the, we had a lot of hockey fans in the office, and sort of showing this people mean like, this is a game, what game is it? And they didn't even say anything. There was just like, get the fuck away from my desk, and that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, and that's when we felt like we sort of stumbled on something that was actually kind of special, right? Because we're actually showing some narrative and we're actually able to show people 
what exactly like actually we're able to represent the game in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I guess basically the, what was really interesting is, is by actually having the data and bringing it into quartz, it allowed us designers to actually run through these and sort of test theories about what we thought would work, but was kind of impossible without like a data set of like 20 or 30 games. Um, and at the end of that, we were actually able to sort of hand this over to the devs and be like, this is exactly how we built it. Um, the other interesting thing is that this, these don't have a lot of visual fidelity. Like, they're really basic. They're just lines and dots. Um, and it would be really easy to kind of bog down and start trying to render these in quartz, but it was sort of decided early, like, no, just leave it simple, and once we find something right, we can make it pretty in Photoshop after. Uh, so the last example is a color system. Um, so the problem was we had a, it was a, it was a white label app, um, and brands would come in and they could hand us assets and we would produce an app for them. Uh, the problem was is these apps required an inordinate amount of assets. Uh, it was done a long time ago. Native, sort of natively drawn elements weren't quite as common, so a lot of things were done with images, uh, which meant that we had to sort of absorb about 100 and somewhat assets off of a client in order to produce an application, which was horrible. Um, so the goal was to reduce that from 100 assets to one asset and then two colors. And the idea was, like, this had to take dozens of brands. Um, so sort of nailed the problem down and said, most brands have two colors. They have a primary and a secondary color. Um, and what can we do with this? Um, so oops, uh, we brought the colors into quartz again. Um, so we had this big table of, like, a bunch of different colors, like 30 different color pairings, uh, some real ones, some, like, sort of weird outlier ones, like blacks and blacks and whites and whites. Um, and basically, we're trying to figure out how we could build a palette based off of just two colors completely programmatically. Um, and the way we did this was we basically established early that we wanted to go from kind of a flat style as everything was sort of shifting, shifting towards beforehand. Um, we wanted something that was very like tonally rich, so the blacks and the whites wouldn't be stark blacks and whites. It'd actually be based off this primary color. Um, and basically, we wanted it to look unique enough for each brand that came in. Um, and you can't really see it on the projection, but the whites, there's sort of like this richness to each one. You really get it on, uh, like iOS devices have just fantastic displays. So you get this sort of like rich tonality in the whites and blacks. Um, so the way they did this was, is again, going into Quartz, uh, built all these elements natively um, so that we could quickly go through and test different colors. Um, so basically how it worked was, I'll jump back, it's a little clear. Um, these primary colors, you can see they're sort of shifted lighter and darker. Um, and this is going to get kind of nitty gritty, but basically by shifting the luminescence of any one color, we could sort of keep it like, like with hue and saturation the same as the primary without uh, screening it out, um, but allowing us to sort of adjust the dark and the light. Um, and basically all that entailed was is, is math. Um, so that was the one time we had to get an engineer involved is like trying to figure out, well, I know that I want the shift to fall off as like my base color gets darker or brighter, um, and sort of talking to the devs about like what kind of curves we'd use for that, but once we got that, we were actually able to go into Quartz and live tweak all of these curves and all that math while trying to try out all the different colors and really come up with a system that was robust enough to kind of handle anything. Oops. Um, so in the end, we were able to put through these 30 colors. Each one looks pretty unique. Um, there's a lot of interesting sort of reverse code. Um, there was this really nice algorithm that uh, Panic did that like counters the green, because um, greens apparently don't reverse black and white if you're just reading brightness. Um, that's really interesting. That's another topic, though. <laughs> um, but basically, we were able to create this thing that was robust enough to handle all this, and we managed to get it down to a point where we did only need two colors and one vector version of a logo, and we could put out an entire app that looked unique to the brand and didn't require any additional work on their team or our team's part. Um, so basically, is, I'm going wildly fast, but that's okay. Uh, basically, my, my takeaway is that every prototype is different, um, and that you really shouldn't build more than you need. And again, like building something that really focuses on a very specific problem. So like in the first example, we just need to figure out fonts. In the second example, we really need to just figure out how to deal with data. Um, and then the third example, it was like, I know that there's this problem I need to solve. Can I build something that helps me sort of define the system? Um, answer questions that aren't easily solved in mockups. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and use techniques that fit the task. Um, Quartz is, I don't know, Quartz is an interesting example because I've sort of talked earlier about unicorns, what do, what do people who aren't unicorns do? Um, and I feel like Quartz has this odd reputation as this like, very difficult to handle tool. Um, but I also feel like it's a lot friendlier than, than programming. Um, but basically what I'm getting at is there's tools in our toolbox that we should be using that go way beyond just Photoshop and just some of the things we're seeing. Like There's some really interesting uh, things like processing and Quartz that we can use to solve problems that we wouldn't otherwise think about. Um, and just to like, under, underline the point, like, I feel like click-through prototype stuff is still super valuable. We should all be doing those, especially for research. Um, but yeah, uh, I was told to leave time for questions, so I left a lot. <laughs>
Um, so feel free to ask me anything, especially about hockey. No, maybe. Yeah, that's okay. Well, well, what was the latest prototype you did for Asana? Um, right now, I'm doing a lot of click-through prototypes for Asana. Um, I'm working on a, a redesign of their mobile application, so we're going through a lot of tests to see like how things work. So that's using things like uh, Flinto, um, which is fantastic. If you haven't used Flinto, do so. Um, I was using Briefs for a while, um, but ended up moving over to Flinto. Um, but yeah, so like for me, like that kind of problem, like a user research problem, things like click-through prototypes are fantastic. Um, but there's sort of like those bigger problems that I find kind of interesting as well. How do you get a prototype if you want to start a massive research uh, in a really wide class so you have to build a product and build a product? How do you? Oh, good call. Is that uh, sorry, can you repeat the last part? How, how do you put something that's really a prototype in, within the context of a product that's already ready for us? I mean, it, to me, it's always sort of, oh, the question was, is how do, you, how do you integrate a product or a prototype into a product that's already really mature and test that? Um, I think you still have to break it out. Um, like, for example, if you're testing sort of a component of something, I still think the prototype, based on time, is going to have to sort of exist in sort of a narrow, a narrow scope. For example, like, uh, if we were redesigning something in mobile that was like a portion of the application, I would probably, probably just test that specific part of it as opposed to like the entire experience. Way back. Um, the question is, what about making prototypes for uh, getting stakeholder buy-in and communication? Um, that's interesting. I, I, there was this great presentation uh, three weeks ago um, from one of the guys at RDO, and he, he just built a movie. Um, like, he built a movie of all the interactions and sort of, like, went through the major use cases um, and found that to be really effective. Um, again, I think things like click-through prototypes do a really good job of that. I find that, like, if you can take your, even your wireframes and, like, chuck them in Flinto really quick and throw them on a device and put them in front of somebody just to get off, like, a core concept, like, works super, super well. Like, the moment people can touch things and move back and forth and it works, like, more or less the way they expect, it sells it really quickly. Cool. Oh, wait, one back left. Um, basically, for me, it's really assessing like what I'm trying to solve and picking the tool to fix it. Um, the question was, is uh, what's the what's my process for approaching prototyping? Um, like, so for example, when we were sort of attacking that color system problem, um, originally the idea was is we'd pair with a dev and we'd sort of like talk to them about the ways we wanted to do it, but it was actually really hard to articulate like how the problem was actually going to get solved. Like, oh well, I need these curves, and like when it gets brighter, I need it to not get quite as bright. And they're like, I don't really understand what you're saying. Um, so sort of like digging in and really, really like trying to analyze the problem and realizing that we couldn't just solve it with something like Photoshop and we had to go in and actually like do a little bit of math ourselves which would have led us to something like Quartz. Um, but yeah, generally just sort of assessing the problem and figuring out, to me it's like figuring out like very specifically what the problem is and finding a tool that suits that. Um, the question was, is, do you find anything's lost between uh, prototype and production? Um, what exactly, like, give me an example of what you feel like gets lost. You, you build a product based on some assumptions that you got from building the prototype, and then you launch it, and it's something that no longer exists. Uh, much like the last presentation, I feel like it's sort of a case of if what you build, with your, what you're prototyping and what your, your assumptions are turn out to be wrong, I don't think there's any real way to avoid that. You kind of just got to run with it. I mean, the best thing is, is like if you can bring in more real data and do more testing early before you launch something, I mean, that'll always give you a better idea of it. Um, but at the end of the day, like you kind of only have your assumptions to run on until you actually test it, so. How do you manage uh, prototypes and uh, specifications? Um, specifications as in like red lines? Right. Um, I feel like prototypes can kind of become part of that. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it sort of really depends on how you do red lines. Um, at my last job, we did incredibly, incredibly detailed red lines. Um, we were working a lot with offshore stuff, so it was sort of like, I need to specify everything down to the pixel, plus all the fonts and all the colors and all the assets and all the different kind, like, sizes of the assets. Um, and I feel like for that, like, prototypes work best for communicating ideas that can't be expressed on paper. Um, so like things like animation, um, like when I tap this button, this panel's gonna slide in in this way and it's gonna sort of like fall back. Um, that kind of stuff is really good and you can kind of either, like you can do like stuff like that in After Effects really easily. Um, I found the advantage, what, one of the things that sort of drew me to Quartz uh, last year, like late last year, was the idea that it's great when I can be like, if I click this button, this happens. 
um, or if I swipe this thing, this happens. Um, but I find if you can actually make it interactive and hand that to a dev, um, it actually allows them to like touch it and try to break it. And if the prototype can actually be robust enough to handle that, then they don't. All those sort of like questions about. It's kind of like when something feels really good, it's really hard to describe why it feels good. Like when I swipe it and I like, if I lift my finger off quickly, it kind of goes back in place in a certain way. Um, and I feel like if you just hand something off to a dev and you're kind of haphazardly like, yeah, it'll swipe, just deal with that. You get all these weird things happening, like maybe it doesn't stay under your finger when you're actually moving it. Or maybe like when you swipe, it doesn't bother coming back if it doesn't cross a certain threshold. And if you can build something that sort of makes that so they can actually touch it and try it, um, their, if their product doesn't meet up to that, then it's like, well, if the designer could build a prototype that did it and yours doesn't do it, why didn't it work? Um, so I feel like uh, prototypes while I'm doing specking or while we're doing specking are better about uh, sort of augmenting what you can just express on the paper, um, which really comes down to sort of complex interactions and movement. Um, it depends on the sort of complexity of it. Um, if it's doing something like, I was giving that example of like if it's swiping and if I cross like a halfway point and it snaps back or whatever, uh, generally something like quartz, um, just because it gives that kind of flexibility. Um, if it's not that, like if it's just a simple demonstration of like, oh, I want it to blur and move and do this, uh, something like After Effects is really helpful. Uh, Keynote is fantastic for really basic native style animations. Um, and the new one, albeit kind of finicky, has a lot of really nice new transitions and build out actions. Um, so those are probably the main three. Cool. Looks like I'm almost out of time anyways. Any more? Cool. Thanks, guys.